Welcome to Concrete Conversations, the Indian real estate podcast. I'm Yash and I'm Akshay and we're the hosts of the show. The worlds of real estate and finance may not always seem like they share a symbiotic relationship, but they do. Capital management is the start of every real estate project. The capital structure and the deals therein can make or break the viability of a project. It's no surprise that for this reason, large property consultants offer a capital markets vertical that connects developers with lenders and investors. But how is the finance for a large real estate project structured? What is the difference between debt and equity exposure in real estate? How does the changing interest rate environment in the US and across the world affect the deployment of capital in real estate? To talk about this and more, we have with us today Jonathan Schneider, Senior Director of JLL Capital Markets across the New England region, and Professor Keith Mansell, Master Lecturer of Strategy and Innovation and the head of the Real Estate Concentration at Boston University's Questrom School of Business. Today, Mr. Schneider and Professor Mansell break down the fundamentals of project finance and structuring and give us an insight into this underlying and vital relationship between marquee projects and the capital that makes them possible. So get ready to capitalize on some unique insights about capital markets. Good morning, Professor Mansell. Good morning, Jonathan. Great to have you both here on Concrete Conversations. How is your Friday morning going so far? Well, so far, without the technical issues, it's going lovely. Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> the sun is shining and uh, it's a Friday afternoon, so uh, no complaints. And I'm on this side of the grass, so... <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we're, we're glad to hear that. And it is true, the sun is shining. Um, but uh, coming back to the conversation that, that we, we are looking to have with you both here today, we'd like to start off each episode by getting a sense of our guests' career journey uh, in, in terms of the, the key experiences and how they got to where they are today. Uh, so uh, this question is for both of you. Whoever feels like they would like to take this first, feel free. Um, but if we could get a sense of your career overviews before we dive into conversation. I'll defer to the esteemed professor. Oh, very kind of you. <laughs> well, this is Keith Munsell, and I am the head of the real estate concentration in the business school at Boston University, Questrom School of Business. Um, interestingly enough, I arrived there 45 years ago, uh, just by kind of by happenstance. Uh, when I you know, was getting my undergrad, well, when I was getting my undergraduate degree in civil engineering, uh, I went to work up here in Boston and realized that this is not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Went back to school and was disappointed to note that there were no real estate courses offered in the business school. And so I pestered the dean a little bit about that. And while I was doing that, um, a couple of buddies and I bought uh, some small multifamily houses while I was still at BU. Um, <clears throat> went to work for IBM. Um, and as you know, an expert really just means that somebody knows a little bit more about something than you do. And so quickly I became the expert in multifamily housing clearly a misnomer, but nevertheless, since I own some multifamily housing, when it came time to selling to computers uh, to the real estate industry, uh, they asked me to come along on those sales pitches. I quickly realized that I was on the wrong side of the table and that I wanted to actually own, operate, manage, develop uh, housing, and then in particular, multifamily housing. Uh, went to work uh, in the industry for a number of years. Uh, the latter part of my career uh, was in the C-suite, if you will, for development companies, either being the COO, the CEO, the executive vice president, the senior vice president, somewhere in that range. Um, and for the last decade or so, I did mortgages. And now I've retired from the out of BU side businesses, if you will, and uh, just concentrating on BU at the latter part of my career. Right. Right. Great. And, and Jonathan, what about you? Uh, so I really think my career, you know, began, um, you know, as a student at, uh, at BU because it really gave me the, you know, the strong, you know, basis for what I wanted to do, um, you know, going forward professionally. And, and I was a liberal arts uh, major there and right. <laughs> I knew I didn't want to be 
you know, a teacher or, you know, uh, I was planning on going to law school. I no longer wanted to go to law school. Um, and I really kind of just focused on, you know, commercial real estate. And at the time it was, it was banking. So I started my career uh, in banking, um, you know, after I graduated BU and uh, I graduated in 88 and started in banking early 90s mm -hmm. and i you know i stayed uh, in in lending for you know some somewhere close to 17 years working on some really you know extraordinary projects from you know the development of the new boston garden to you know a number of other you know really interesting deals and working on you know bank mergers and and you know some really really interesting things but at a certain point i, I wanted to go beyond that and um you know left the banking world and started an investment fund a small investment fund with a partner right raised a bunch of money and we um started uh, acquiring and redeveloping um you know luxury condominiums and you know the back bay area of boston and brookline and you know south end um, and then after a short period of time, I decided, you know, I wanted to get out of that, that aspect of it because I really wanted to meld, you know, what I had been doing in banking to, you know, what I was doing in the real estate world and, and act more as an advisor to folks. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it, it sent me onto the path where, where I am now, which is, you know, in an advisory role at uh, JLL, um, essentially, um, you know, assisting uh, developers and other real estate professionals in, in, you know, raising capital for large scale projects. And I continue to do that today. And, and you know, one of the few people that really, really enjoy uh, what I do uh, day in and day out. Right. Which is which is great to hear. Um, and I think that perfectly sets up our discussion for this conversation today, because you're talking about an advisory role in for raising capital at JLL. And the subject at hand is capital markets. And we wanted to introduce the topic of capital markets within real estate to our audience. So with that in mind, the the, f the first question that we thought we, we could ask both of you and the second part specifically for Jonathan is, um, how do you define capital markets within the scope of real estate? And then uh, Jonathan, more specifically, what role does capital markets play within the entire gamut of, of JLL offerings? Jonathan, can I opine on this first? Go right ahead. I was going to say very simply, capital markets are the source of funds. Investment markets are the use of funds. Right. Right. Yeah, which is, which is very true. So, you know, at, at JLL and, and, you know, most similar uh, real estate services firms, capital markets is, you know, really, you know, the raising of capital, whether it's, you know, through debt vehicles, equity, uh, investors, um, you know, public markets, bond markets, um, you know, and also, you know, the the selling and acquiring of, of real estate. So, you know, really on point to what um, Professor Munzel was saying. And, and I would like to add something to, to that. And that is, when I view capital markets, I, I look at long term, either equity or financial investment so that it is not really um, just in and out of a market, but you're in there for a little while. Right. Right. Jonathan, would you agree to that? Sure. I mean, it, it, you know, it, one of the first questions we always ask, um, you know, certainly on the debt and, um, you know, equity side of the capital markets business is, you know, what, what's our client strategy? Is it a short term hold? Is it a long term hold? Is it a medium hold? You know, and it really depends on the you know, the source of the capital, you know, whether it's a, you know, an investment fund, you know, maybe, you know, up to seven years, because that's the life of their fund. If it's a, you know, say a family office uh, and high net worth individuals, it could be more generational. It could be up to 30 plus years. Wow. That, that, that's great. I mean, that sounds like it's a significant uh, time horizon that, that, that investors could look at. I think it, it might be helpful for us to illustrate that with a, a what we're talking about with a bit of an example. And I think, Jonathan, I know you have an example here for us uh, in Boston. W would you be happy to introduce that for us right now? Um, sure. I mean, listen, you know, o over the course of a, you know, <laughs> a long career, you know, there's been, you know, many, many uh, interesting, exciting projects um, over the years. But, right. you know, this one was the last few years, you know, literally right before um, the outbreak of COVID. So it's, you know, it's fresh in mind, but, you know, we, I had the you know great opportunity to work on you know raising uh, equity, so investor funds for um, 
the development of a large scale um, convention center uh, hotel, which is the, the new Omni Seaport, uh, which is directly across the street from the, um, the Boston uh, Convention Center. Um, it's a thousand, approximately a thousand rooms. Wow. So it is, you know, quite literally now, it's either the largest or probably the second largest hotel um, in the city of Boston. Certainly has the largest ballrooms, uh, which is a very important component of in the profitability of a hotel, particularly one that's uh, adjacent to a convention center. Right. So in, you know, the, the capitalization, so the total cost of, of, building this, uh, you know, was somewhere close to $700 million. And we we're tasked with, uh, you know, raising a certain amount of investor money for it and, and uh, construction uh, funds for, for the project. Um, I mean, it was a challenging project from, from many standpoints. You had, you know, increasing uh, construction costs during that point in time that were actually increasing as we're going through the whole process, which you know, by the way, it took several years to to complete just the capital markets portion of this project. We worked on it for quite a while. Right. Um, had a lot of different challenges. Um, you know, the cost basis uh, was one of them, but certainly we're dealing with, you know, multiple ownership groups. So three, four different ownership groups. We're dealing with uh, state agencies because the, the land on which the building was going to be built was on a uh, mass port ground lease. So you have to deal with you know, a lot of um, regulatory issues involving, you know, state agencies, the FAA because of proximity to the airport. So you're dealing with height issues, you know, a whole, whole number of different things. And, you know, and at that time, you know, raising capital for a hotel, particularly a convention center hotel was, you know, not exactly, um, you know, top of mind for a lot of uh, lending institutions. So we, we had to go to quite a few institutions and ended up you know, putting together a, a consortium of, uh, you know, probably about 10 different lenders to uh, to get that project done. Wow, that sounds like uh, quite a lot of legwork, <laughs> I can imagine. It, it was, it was. I, I, I have to ask a quick follow-up here, is it, it, just to get a better sense of the grassroots of, of the of the industry, um, what how does it typically work for, for a capital raise for a project like this or any other project? Is it that clients come to JLL and uh, with specific requirements in mind? Or is it that uh, JLL approaches clients, uh, potential clients, or is it that lenders come to JLL uh, for projects that clients have approached them for? Yeah, it could be a little bit of, bit of you know, all of that. But in, in most cases, which was a, the similar case here, um, the, the developer, which in this case was the Davis companies, had approached us. Um, they had a partner in hand which was uh, the Omni uh, Hotel Group, which typically likes to own their hotel. So they're going to be a 50% partner. So that's that was great. The uh, Davis uh, Group, um, as much as they love the project, they need to diversify their risk as well. So they really didn't want to hold a complete 50% uh, interest in it. So they wanted, you know, tasked us with raising uh, additional investors to come into that project. And additionally, as part of the the bidding process to win the build the development rights on this site, the Davis companies um, uh, promised that they would raise money from um, minority groups um, to uh, to have an opportunity to invest in a, in a large scale um, commercial project like this, which you know, frankly and unfortunately, in this city and a lot of cities that you know minority groups have not had the ability or the access to invest in those type of projects. So right. it was very exciting from that standpoint. So they, they tasked us to, to kind of raise capital under that auspices. And, you know, we had to go through a whole, you know, whole range of people from, from, um, you know, state agencies, you know, state pension funds to, um, the pension funds of, um, of uh, unions uh, all across the board. So it, it was a long, long process and um, an interesting one. And a lot, oftentimes to raise equity, the equity investors like to know what the debt's going to look like. So it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg. So you have to go through both processes at the same time. Right. Uh, that actually, uh, Jonathan, that leads to a very interesting follow up that I wanted to ask you here, which is how does uh, 
how do these preferences get defined in terms of debt versus equity and uh, what sort of uh, you know maybe investment goals are these investors looking at when they choose one or the other so uh, sure i mean as you know professor manzel will will attest that you know in you know, in real estate in commercial real estate you know leverage is you know, is beneficial to any any project you don't want to over leverage a project but you want to you know you want to obtain the maximum amount of uh, of of uh, debt possible on a particular project to make it viable. Um, that way, you're utilizing someone else's money, and in hopefully it's positive leverage against what you know the returns will ultimately be on the property. Um, you know that that way it allows you know the investors to use their 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 cash on a number of different projects. So right. you know so the first part of this is, is try to determine what is that level of of debt that this property can support this project can support and then backfill the additional the remaining pieces of that with investor equity may i make an observation here absolutely um and jonathan you said uh positive leverage and i'm not sure who the the uh target market is but people may not understand the meaning of that and just kind of simply put it's where your return on equity would be greater than your cost of debt. So uh, what that helps do is it helps exacerbate the return on equity if in fact you have positive leverage. Right, right. Which is a very, which is a very difficult thing to do in today's um, um, interest rate environment. And that's why you're not seeing a whole lot of uh, development projects or any other um, you know, real major scale uh, real estate transactions, uh, you know, going on at the at the moment. Right, and and I think that that perfectly sets us up for uh, I mean a question that we already thought we should we should ask you in in this conversation, is and that's about interest rates. And could you maybe elaborate a little bit about the impact of interest rates on capital markets and 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 the job that that you do within capital markets in terms of planning for raising capital from different sources. How does one plan for in- interest rate fluctuations in times of uncertainty like we've seen in, in recent years? Yeah, I mean, listen, there, there's a number of ways to, to plan for it, but you know, the most common way and predictable way is to obtain, you know, obtain fixed rated um, debt. So that, that's not floating. Right. Um, alternatively, because um, oftentimes with development project it's floating ready rate uh floating rate debt so you want to hedge that right. right so there's a number of derivative projects and we can get into you know um our products rather uh we can get into the specifics of those but uh, derivative products are for lack of a better term basically are uh interest rate hedges which are you know better described as insurance policies you know that protects your you know your downside and you know limits your upside somewhat to on um, fluctuations of um, of interest rates right it's very expensive um particularly in times of uncertainty they become even more expensive and um you know they can either make or break a project but yet interest rates are um you know it's probably the key component to 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 any project it's um you know it either makes it viable or it makes it not viable as as interest rates go up, you, the amount of debt you're now able to uh, obtain that the property can support goes down. Right. So um, you now have to raise more equity, and that's very expensive. It's more expensive than than debt. So it, you can see how it has you know a number of different um, consequences uh, you know up and down the capital stack. Right. And I think this is Keith again, and I I think, as Jonathan mentions, that what's happening is because of times of uncertainty and fluctuating interest rates that lenders in particular are hesitant to put too much debt on a project. And so they're being relatively conservative. Would you agree with that comment, Jonathan? I I would. Um, Yeah, I certainly would. Um, But it's also the, the, the fact that you know, as you know, what we're seeing now transpiring as interest rates go on, this really you know pertains to the refinance market. So you know, we've got you know, a whole whole market here of, of you know properties that have mortgages on them that need to be refinanced at some point. And as rates go up, you know, in theory, 
you know, the capitalization rate uh, of the property is going up as well. And therefore, the property is not worth as much. Their cash flow is worth, uh, you know, a lower return uh, going forward. And so that, you know, so in other words, a loan that might have 60 percent debt on it when they go to refinance it, that 60 percent is now equivalent to, say, 75 percent. Right. right. So, you know, we're, we now have to find either additional equity sources for, you know, those properties or, you know, very um, or new or new um, debt products um, or, you know, quasi debt products that will help uh, get them back to leverage levels to uh, sustain their properties. So it, it, there, it's just wide ranging issues occurring with uh, a rising interest rate market. And again, I would like you to make an observation here, and that is, uh, Jonathan, you said about cap rates, and for everybody in the industry, they know what you're talking about. But for those who might be tuning in who aren't familiar with that, what you're really looking at is the denominator. And what you're saying is, uh, if I take the net operating income and I divide it by a larger denominator, which is a an amalgamation of desired return on equity and cost of capital. If the denominator increases, the value decreases. Right. Right. Um, and, and just as a, a follow up for uh, Professor Mansell or Jonathan, um, would, would you say that um, this the rise in interest rates is going to, uh, you know, be with us for the medium term because uh, inflation is quite high uh, in the US as well? So does this seem like something that would require uh, developers and investors to you know, readjust their preferences for the medium or long term? Well, I'll take a first stab at that, Jonathan, but I would very much appreciate your input too, because you're where the rubber meets the road every day of the week. Sure thing. <laughs> I would say that um, with the war in Ukraine, with the rise in the cost of fossil fuels, with inf inflation, with the green transition, with ESG, I think we're going to see uh, interest rates staying high relative to what they were maybe a year or a year and a half ago. But again, historically, and I think we forget about this, historically, they're still not bad. Right, right. That, that's correct. Um, you know, it's true. And, you know, it's you know, one of the most difficult things we, you know, we have to do is explaining to our clients that, uh, you know, historically, you know, this isn't terrible. Um, and, um, but, you know, when you're buying your property, you know, as, you know, we were discussing before at a capitalization rate that's at 4% and, you know, now your interest rates are, that you're paying to the lender, you know, approaching, you know, seven, 8%, you have an issue, right? And, and as much as we say, yeah, it's still not bad, it's still an issue. Um, in terms of, you know, where we see rates are going, you know, listen, I have the same crystal ball that, uh, that you know, <laughs> everyone else on this podcast has. Um, right. <laughs> what, what I do have and what we all have is the benefit of history. Right. And, you know, if you go back to, say, 1990 and you follow every single tightening interest rate tightening period by the fed uh from that period to now what what you see is that you know after you know once the fed pauses and that's what we're all waiting for now when they say listen you know we're we're good we're gonna hold what we've seen over over that course of those you know 30 odd years is that you know rates start coming down at the longest period of time it was about 14 months or or so after the pause, shortest period of time was around three months. Right. So on average, over those you know various um, uh, you know tightening periods, you know since 1990, it's averaged about nine months uh, before the interest rates start coming down at a at a decent clip. Now that being said, you know the Fed has indicated that they don't want to get into a situation that's happened you know, once before at least where they've paused and they may have paused prematurely and they have to start increasing again. That they want to avoid, uh, and they've been very vocal about wanting to avoid that. So I, I truly believe this is going to be on the longer side of that, you know, three to 14 month period before rates start trickling down. And, um, you know, that's just my gut. And uh, just based on historic, you know, information and what 
they're indicating in their in their minutes of their meetings. Um, that being said, when they do come down, I don't think they're going to be, you know, to what you know Professor Monzel was saying. I don't think they're coming down to the levels that we've had uh, over the past few years. If you remember, you know, their rates were virtually at zero from the Fed. Um, you know. We're coming out of the Great Recession, you know, things were good, but then you were hit with COVID, um, you know, keeping their rates at a very low uh, period of time. You know, those are just not sustainable over, you know, a great period of time. So they, I think they will come down. I don't think they'll be down to where they were before. And if they do, it's probably part of a much greater problem that we probably don't want them to come as low as they were before. <laughs> right. Well, I think, I think there's also uh, perhaps a quick aside here, but an interesting component given the work that you do for capital markets. Um, but given the, uh, as you mentioned, the previous recessions, if you look at just the last 20 years and you look at real estate in, in the last 20 years in the US and globally, there have been several um, pretty major slowdowns or, or crises quite closely linking to real estate. Um, we talk about the 2008 housing market crashes as, as obviously one of the biggest examples. Do you find that the clients that you work with, uh, the lenders that you work with are, are kind of more in a once bitten, twice shy situation? Or, and do you does it make your job a lot harder to sort of put the same context out to them that you've done for us over here? Well, listen. You know, the banks are are driven by their cost of capital, and that and that's really being driven by the Fed right now. Um, right. You know, it, there's a lot of different scenarios going on. What happened during the you know the Great Recession? Um, there was a there was a you know massive liquidity crunch at that period of time. Um, right. Right now, what we're seeing now, you know, post COVID, even even now, it, there is no such, you know. Um, liquidity uh, crunch happening with the bank. So, in other words, the, the banks have plenty of money to lend. Um, they're they're happy to lend it. The equity investors are, have plenty of dry capital uh, to put into projects. What they're happy, what banks hate, and what investors hate is uh, are really you know times of uncertainty. And both both lenders and investors right now are just waiting for that signal that okay this is where we're holding and we're we're actually very close to that point up until last friday where uh, when the when the fed well not the fed but the um uh some economic indicators came in um you know showing that there was still you know positive growth uh in um inflation and that kind of threw the market into a little bit of a, a tizzy right Right. Um, and I think uh, we're we're still you know we still have some rate increases coming and then you know probably at least three more and uh, I think everyone's still holding path to the the fact that the Fed will hold at about a five percent uh, target on their Fed funds rate and then once we have that period where they've said okay we're pausing now we're good the capital markets landscape will change people will start transacting um, in a, in a much higher pace right. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, while we're on this topic, I think the recent uncertainty has a lot of people looking up uh, Volcker in the 1980s in the US. That's correct. That's, yeah. <laughs> uh, so moving on from there, um, you know, another question that we wanted to ask you, especially, uh, as you said, in the face of the uncertainty we're seeing now, um, typically at what stage of a project does, uh, you know, the the planning for the raising and deployment of capital take place and does the current you know situation in terms of uncertainty affect the you know the norm in terms of capital planning um so the second part of your question yes 100 percent right. um but the, the planning you know the the capital planning is is one of the earliest um things you do you know because it's either it either makes a project viable or not viable um so it's literally it's you know as you know pen hits paper um or fingers hit keyboards um <laughs> it's the first thing that you're you're one of the first things you're looking at and that's why you know we're we're involved very 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 early in in the projects um you know planning part just to get a feel and unfortunately it's a very liquid market and fluid market i should say that that you know interest rates and, and capital is changing from from moment to moment, so we're constantly, you know, updating the data on particular projects and and you know adjusting interest rate reserves and all sorts of different things. So it's uh, to answer your question, it's a very very it's very early on in the project that we're involved in, in least 
you know, helping to map out the, the amount of, um, you know, data project can, can uh, support as well as those interest rates. And then we're constantly updating it. And this goes on for a long period of time, you know, before they're ready to go to market and actually source that capital. Right. And I think uh, an interesting f- a follow-up over here, since we're talking about capital planning, uh, is and we, we, when you look at real estate you, as an outsider, sometimes it's, it's very easy to miss asset classes within real estate. We, common ones, you think housing and you think office spaces. This does the structure and the nature of planning for, for capital uh, vary with different asset classes. We look at logistics, you look at warehousing, you look at um, retail, we've talked about hotels. So we, there's a whole gamut of asset classes that we talk about in real estate. Sure. Uh, you know, retail and, and medical office and, you know, you can go on and on and on with the, the various um, product types. And, you know, each product type is, um, is, is very different and unique and either um, they're in a position that they're well it, it's a well liked product type right now as a for instance multifamily and an industrial are are still very very um sought after you know it, multifamily in particular because that's the ultimate uh inflation hedge you, you know in other words you're increasing you know your rental rates you know monthly you know or annually uh you know throughout the life of a of a of a project or you know the life of that that building and you so you can adjust rents you know to coincide with where interest rates are going so it it really helps you in that in that process other product types you know not so much you know hospitality you know that's another one you can change your room rates you know daily (laughs) and so that is a good uh hedge however you know covid has put a you know a whole new light on the types of projects that will be financed or how much lenders are willing to to lend on on a hotel you know as opposed to 60 percent, maybe they're more comfortable at 40 percent um uh, I, i'd like to make a comment if we're still uh, live about this um i think jonathan's point is well taken and that it depends on the asset um it also depends on the on the type and location of that asset so if we're talking about core or core plus or value add or opportunistic investment i think that uh, the amount of uh, the capital markets appetite uh, differs not only depending upon asset class but also dependent upon really location and type of product right 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 I think that that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And and a, a quick follow up here. We touched upon refinancing earlier. You talked about that. Uh, when we talk about planning for for, uh, for capital for projects, uh, could you just tell us a little bit more about the role that capital markets plays within refinancing for projects? Is it something that only happens uh, in times of economic uncertainty, or is refinancing something that uh, one might plan for at the onset of a project as well? Sure. You you want to be able to when you first obtain financing, you want to you want to know that the economics of the prop uh, of the property or the project are such that when that loan matures, that you have ample economics uh, and cash flow to support a loan that at a minimum will pay that uh, existing debt off, and in the best case scenario, um, provide you more. Uh, more proceeds uh, for the loan. So right. yeah, you, you certainly want to consider how much debt you're putting on at the outset in relation to um, how it's going to get repaid. Um, and certainly lenders uh, look at that as well. They, they want to know, uh, you know, certainly how the debt looks like at the beginning of the project, but they want to know what it's going to look like at the uh, expiry of their debt. Yeah, you know, will they be able to get paid? They they really do enjoy uh, having their loans repaid at some point in time. Right. So um, it is very much top of mind at, on every project and every uh, every property. And, you know, right now, you know, that's mainly what we're working on right now are uh, refinances um, to, uh, you know, help stem some of the uncertainty that we have uh, right now in the interest rates. 
right absolutely right um and and just uh, you know since we're talking uh, about uh, refinancing and other uh, adjacent topic that i thought we could ask you about was uh, stressed assets so does uh, in your role at jll do you also deal with uh, stressed assets and if so it, what role does jll capital markets play there sure i mean we're we're capital market advisors right. so oftentimes we're we're brought into a transaction um you know, you know because we can execute and, and provide kind of the best best capital solutions for a project but oftentimes we're brought into projects because there's a problem right and they need us to solve that problem right so uh yes as we we're stating before as you know the interest rates are going up and capitalization rates are rising as well therefore the you know causing the the value of these properties to um to decrease you have a situation where you know we call it being upside down uh, sometimes the debt is is larger and, and and higher than what the property is worth right and we've got to figure out you know real um solutions to to overcome that um or maybe it's a situation where originally the debt was only at 60% the property can only support a 60% loan lenders only want to provide maybe a 60% loan however because of the value of the property has gone down um a bit it's maybe now a 75% loan how do we overcome that um and there we utilize a whole slew of you know various capital methods whether it's you know um you know mezzanine debt sources which are more expensive or uh you know a source that referred to as preferred equity you know manners that may um dilute the owner's interest in the property but will certainly save them from um you know certain foreclosure right right great i think with that uh, jonathan and professor mansa we've come to the close of our conversation today uh, i want to thank both of you on behalf of yash and i uh, for taking the time to join us here on concrete conversations i can i think i can say with with a fair degree of certainty that this conversation today would have raised the value of the capital that we would provide as a podcast to any listeners out there. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> We're very very welcome and uh, happy to join you anytime. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to follow Concrete Conversations on Instagram to know more about upcoming episodes and for some behind the scenes content. For more deep dives into the world of Indian real estate, stay tuned for more Concrete Conversations. Yeah.